Hey, everyone. Thanks. Uh, we're back here after lunch in Austin. Well, after lunch for some of us, some of us still didn't eat lunch. <laughs> but uh, we're in Austin at the Linux Foundation Open Security Summit, and I want to introduce you to a gentleman named Jonathan Lightshu. And I'm really proud to say that Jonathan is the first recipient of the Dan, Kam Dan Kaminsky Scholarship Fellowship. Fellowship from the folks at Human Security, which of, of course was Dan's company. And you know, as someone who knew Dan for many, many years, um, I don't know. I, yeah. It's kind of bittersweet to tell you, I gotta be honest, it's a little bittersweet. You know, unfortunately Dan passed away way, way, way too young. And he was 42. Yeah. And, but I'm glad to see you know, his name carried on and, and someone doing good work. Anyway, Jonathan, welcome and thanks for joining us on Tech Strong TV. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, let's let's kick this off first. The Dan Kaminsky Fellowship. What yeah. is it? So, it was created after Dan's passing by Human Security to commemorate Dan's memory to allow an individual or group of individuals to... Um, do work in open source that helps improve the the you know does something good for the world and helps improve and hopefully helps improve the security of the internet. Um, Dan was well known for his kindness and his giving back to the community. Um, he was also very well known for some of his really famous security research, like the DNS vulnerability that you know he silently fixed by spending I think a lot of his own time to go to every single vendor and say this is a massive vulnerability, let's get this fixed. And so, to commemorate his memory, Human created a fellowship to try to encourage and support someone going out into the world and making some positive change in the security internet, so. Good, and congratulations to you for winning Thank it. Um, Jonathan, just in way of background, we, we spoke a bit off camera. Um, you've been doing security research now for about four years, four plus years. Three or four years, yeah. Uh, I found some, some, some whoppers one of which was was the Zoom yeah. uh, vulnerability that came out. Uh, it was during COVID, I remember. No, no, no. This is the one the year before COVID. Oh, the year before COVID. Yes, yes, okay. yes. There was another one there was during another COVID one. Yeah, that yeah. was nasty. That, there was a couple of ones for COVID. No. Look, and no, no knock on Zoom. It can happen to anyone, yes. obviously. They're, during COVID, they experienced 10 years worth of growth and 10 years worth of vulnerabilities in a week. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people do. Yeah. But um, anyway... But you're also working with the Linux Foundation a little bit yes. now, and, and um, why don't you tell our yeah, audience so a little bit about that? I've been very passionate about vulnerability disclosure. Um, I do open source security research. I find vulnerabilities. I'm not doing that very actively now. I've The Dan Kaminsky Fellowship, I've pivoted slightly, and I'm doing more uh, finding widespread common security vulnerabilities and then generating thousands of pull requests to fix those vulnerabilities. But I have, in the past, I have something like, I think 40 is low. I think I have more like CVE numbers that I've had assigned for vulnerabilities that I've worked on. And so I have some experience with getting vulnerabilities found and fixed. Um, and I'm also working with someone named Madison. She works at GitHub. Um, she formerly worked at um, CERT at Carnegie Mellon. And um, there's some other people together were working as a part of the vulnerability disclosure working group as part of the, uh, the, the Open Source Security Foundation Linux group to come up with a guide for people who have found vulnerabilities either with intention or accidentally to help guide them through, okay, what is vulnerability disclosure? How do you do it? What's the, like, what are the norms? Not like, you know, you must do this, but like these are the norms and this is maybe some of the history as to why these norms exist. This is what coordinated vulnerability disclosure is. This is what full disclosure is. This is why you might want to use these disclosure methodologies. You know, the suggestion that we're putting forward, at least we're putting, I'm putting forward is use coordinated vulnerability disclosure first. If that doesn't work, you know, here are some escalation patterns you, or escalation paths you can go down. If all else fails, full disclosure, at least it'll get it, the information out there into the world so that people know that they need to mitigate this vulnerability or remove some vulnerable package or fix it in some way. So, so look, our audience is pretty sophisticated. Yep. But for those of you who are not familiar with vulnerability disclosure protocol, right? The idea here, and, and you're an expert, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been no, doing this a long time. The idea here is if you find a vulnerability and you want to just, you know, can't wait to tell the world that you 
as a researcher found a vulnerability, you probably compounded that vulnerability by a thousand fold by just announcing it and putting it out there in the public because now every bad guy in the world who maybe didn't know about that vulnerability is going to say, oh, there's a vulnerability yep. here. Let's find an exploit yep. before these guys patch it. Yep. So the concept of responsible vulnerability disclosure probably started in the early 2000s, maybe even before. Yep. And and it, it, basically, back then it was much simpler than it is now, but basically back then it was the idea of, hey, let the owner of the code, the owner of, you know, who has the vulnerability, know about it, give them a reasonable amount of time to get a fix out there so that by the time this thing goes public or is announced publicly, there is a fix in place and... and you know, these, you know, newly announced vulnerabilities are not exploited. Yep. Now, a lot of, you know, funny thing happened on the way to the market, right? A, a lot of companies, you know, would stick their head in the sand when told about vulnerabilities. Yes. yes. And refuse to do anything. And they, yep. and they give a million and one excuses. That's why the term... Um Responsible disclosures have been dropped from a lot of the common discourse, and we've turned to the term coordinated vulnerability disclosure because the researchers are saying, you know, a lot of develop, a lot of maintainers are saying, well, it's responsible if you disclose to us, and we're not going to give any information out. And the re researchers like, no, that's not responsible. And so there's this whole like the word responsibility and, and it's, ethics. It's semantics. Or, yeah, 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 absolutely. So coordinated vulnerability disclosure is the idea that researchers will come and say, here's a vulnerability, here's a deadline that I'm going to disclose by. We should have a fix out by then, please. If you don't okay, it's going to go public, you know, if you want to protect your users, this is the you should work with me within this time frame. And that has had a, um, Google Project Zero has a lot of statistics around that when you have a fixed deadline for coordinated vulnerability disclosure, that it actually has a very positive impact around getting fixes done in a very condensed yeah. amount of time and actually getting those out to users. But that being said, there are, you know, uh, certain... Uh, you know, certain uh, uh, situations where they just can't get the fix done in time and they'll yes. work with the researcher and say, okay, we're going to wait 120 days instead of 90 or whatever it yeah. is to give them time to get it out and get it out to the channel, so to speak. Um, you know, and then, and then of course, there's the, the announcement of it. And, the, you know, the good news is, is over the years, this has become a little bit more, not, I don't want to say codified, but and normalized, which is more good. Normalized. It's, it's healthy to be normalized. You run into a lot of bug bounty programs and a lot of vulnerability disclosure programs that still have NDAs associated with them, where they say, if you disclose to our program, you're not allowed to disclose unless you get permission from us. And that's been a difficulty. And that's one of the things that I am warning people about in this guide is if you're engaged in a vulnerability disclosure program or a bug bounty program where you found a vulnerability, like a lot of the times I find vulnerabilities unintentionally or intentionally, but I'm there are a lot of bug bounty researchers or bug bounty hackers that look for programs that have money to do the disclosure, right? Yep. I'm going the other way. I'm looking for vulnerabilities and then saying, I found a vulnerability, here it is, right? But when you run into these programs, a lot of them have non-disclosure agreements and you have to get agreement from the maintainer to disclose and you have to be really careful about that because a lot of the times when I'm looking at vulnerabilities in open source software, you need a CVE number, you need disclosure, and so you have to... Um, articulate that potentially beforehand, you have to say to the person, hey, I'm not going to disclose this vulnerability to you under these terms. First, you need to be, a, you need to intention, you need to waive these terms for me before I'm willing to give you the details of the vulnerability because you can set yourself up for potential legal issues or if you're on bug crowd or hacker one, you can potentially get thrown off the platform. Um, which means that you can't make money off of other research that you're doing potentially. So right. there's a lot of pitfalls, and so communicating those pitfalls in these guides to make sure that people are making an informed decision about how they're doing vulnerability disclosure. Yep. Let me just play devil's advocate. Yes. So the flip side of this is if you speak to many maintainers and you say, hey, man, what, what's the deal? The researcher found the bug. Fix it. Yep. You got 90 days. That's an eternity. Fix it. Yep. You know, their, their comeback to you is, well, he only really gave us, or they only gave us 45 days. Yep. Or they threatened unless we give them an exorbitant amount of money. or you know That's and, extortion. And that's not that's legal. That's called extortion, yeah. yes. And, and that's, you know, in a nice way what they're saying. Yeah. Or, 
you know, the, the, this security researcher is so uh, uh, publicity hounded yep. that they just want to get it out there to get their name with it. They don't care about the security implications involved in, in the, doing a responsible disclosure or coordinated disclosure. Yep. So, you know, Jonathan's presenting the security researcher side of it. All I'm saying is, you know how life is. I've lived long enough to know that there's always a million sides to every story. There's the black, the white, and the gray, and there's a lot of gray in between. Yep. But the good news is, as we sit here today, it's a lot better than oh, absolutely. it was when yeah. I was coming up. In I mean, I've, I've heard a lot of the stories from previous companies, and like you do any security research and you just get chased by lawyers, right? Microsoft, everybody, they were really, really bad about that in the past, and it's, yeah. it is has got significantly more normalized now. Um, the DOJ... Well, security researching yes. in general. Security researchers went, you know, you were either a black hat yep. doing it for nefarious purposes, or you were a white hat. People were saying, what the hell are you doing for a living? Yep. Right? You know, what are you making money at? And so now... Now you can make a lot more money as a... Right. As a doing stuff for the good so, right yeah. you could be you could be a white hat security researcher and make a living and yep. and, and it's thanks to dan and people like that who, who made that possible he had a, he had a line you know, I was watching one of his talks he's, he's like you know talking about research and stuff like that and he's like can my hat be any more white yeah, you know, no. like, yeah well, he was he, he really was one he of the good guys it. with it i mean because back then like with the dns thing he literally had to go out to all these vendors yeah. and say please 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 he, he said i think he, he said I, so I went to de the DEF CON group held a funeral for him and somebody told a story about he's like like somebody asked him like do you what would you do if you found another one of those types of vulnerabilities he said I wish I, I hope I, I know he said I hope I never do because it was so much work right because he did the not that he would he would have done the work again I think but he, he was like the internet was broke well but yeah he, he felt a moral obligation to yeah, do no, that work he, yeah. and so he was like, I just hope I don't find another one like that because it's 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 a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do that sort of coordination and yeah. and and. Though I think it would be easier today than it was. Oh, absolutely, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think that I could be wrong, but it was back in two thousand eight. There was still cert and a lot of those things were either didn't exist or were in very early in early their maturity on. and stuff was like that. Was it oh eight? I think it might have been earlier. It was. Yeah, it was around oh eight. I want to feel all right. Yeah. I'm still secure. Yeah, that was when, that was when DEF CON, the, I think that was the year, I could be completely wrong. I think it was around 08, yeah. To me, I, I still secure as a company I co-founded. I left in 08, 09, yeah. after DEF CON that summer. Yeah. So it was around then. Yeah. Anyway, um, I wanted to go back to what you're doing with Linux Foundation. Yes. You're working with a, a bunch of folks and, org, and orgs. Yeah. Tell them a um, bit. So primarily the work that I'm, I'm attending a lot of the different meetings. The other interesting discussions that are going on, I've been particularly passionate about um, uh, security of repositories, um, the repository security. I formerly worked for Gradle, mm -hmm. um, and Gradle is a build tool used to build 90, it's built, used to build 50% of all Java applications and 99% of all Android applications. So if, yep. you, if you have an Android device, you are, Probably you are, Gradle. you, well, you're not running Gradle, but you are, your no, no, app's on, yeah, your, yeah, the app that's on running on your phone got there because Gradle was used to build it. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, and so I've been very passionate about the security of the supply chain and vulnerabilities in that area. And um, I've been kind of hoping for a group to come together to discuss the security and the risks and the, like, hopefully long-term sharing threat intel around these things in this space. Um, and so I'm really glad to see that there's finally a, like, a, a grounding rod, a place for, like, you know, or a, a, a community circle to, for these conversations to, like, finally come together and have discussions around, you know, what are the things that we're doing to secure these things? What are the, like, controls that we can put into place to protect our end users and protect the supply chain that, like, is feeding, you know, multi-billion dollar companies and, you know, small projects, right? Like, how do we protect this stuff, right? And Gradle is used to build Signal, mm -hmm. right? Which is a very important, secu like, security app, right? Like, Absolutely. Um, how do we protect all these things? And so I'm really glad to see that these conversations are, are finally happening. Yeah, no, it's a long time coming. Yeah. Anyway, hey, Jonathan, we're probably way over time, and I know you're supposed, you're supposed to get lunch. Oh, so lunch, yeah. I'm going to let you go eat. Man, yeah. Congratulations. Thank Dan you very much. would be proud. Thank you. Keep up the great work and, and stay in touch. 